that feast is still going to continue. So I'm going to hand the mic over to Brother Shola. And the Lord use us only to bless us. Just trust God that more will come from that source to increase us tonight in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We will still pray. Father, we appreciate you tonight. Amen. We confess our absolute dependence on you. We confess we can do nothing without you. That's your word. You said without me, you can do nothing. Lord, we say we lean on you tonight. We ask for grace. We ask for an entrance into that which is your mind. Your spirit will lead and guide into all truth tonight in the name of Jesus. Blessed be your name, O oh God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We will go again to Jeremiah 31, which is the place we began to look at last Sunday. Um, like was shared then, we had had a time of waiting on the Lord in Lagos, and at the rounding up of the waiting, the Lord had brought this place, Jeremiah 31, into focus. And um, part of what I didn't mention at the Sunday meeting was that one week later, when we traveled to Cameroon for a conference, uh, Brother Alade also coming up, opened to the same place and began to minister. And that was interesting because the meeting we had in Lagos, it wasn't at that particular meeting. And for God to have highlighted this same place as important at this time means that there are a few things that are there that speak to the times in which we are living. And the burden that we began last Sunday and we will continue today is found in Jeremiah 31 verse 6. It says, For there shall be a day that the watchmen upon the Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion, unto the Lord our God. There shall be a day, and I believe we are living in that day at this time, that the watchmen upon the Mount Ephraim, there shall be a cry, Arise ye. So it means prior to that time, there might have been a sitting down, a lying down, a general relaxation. But a cry came Get up, arise. Let us go up to Zion, unto the Lord our God. And on Sunday, we tried to. Uh, Look at why would a people move from Mount Ephraim and go up to Mount Zion? Why would they go from Mount Ephraim and go to Mount Zion? And then we made reference to Joshua chapter 17. We will just quickly look at that to help our understanding as we continue. Joshua chapter 17. But um, that time we looked at the King James Version, but I will look at the Message Version this time around because uh, it's a little more explanatory. Looking at 17, reading from verse 12, it says, The people of Manasseh never were able to take over these towns. 
the Canaanites wouldn't budge. But later, when the Israelites got stronger, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they never did get rid of them. You know, we looked at Joshua chapter 1, where Joshua had told, you know, the people, this is what the Lord says. I am bringing you into a land. The land has varying degrees of water, water being the measure of the, you know, the help you are going to receive. So if you find yourself in the wilderness, which is like a desert, there is no water there. If there's any water, it's very limited. You move to the next one, which is Lebanon. Lebanon, so if you dig a little bit, you find water. Then you move to the Great River, you know. Plenty of water, but not overwhelming. And then you get to the Great Seas. You get to the sea, where every direction you look, you have water. The idea is that I am bringing you into a land. I am bringing you into a realm in me. In that realm, there will be varying degrees of opposition. But the key thing is that no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. The idea being that this realm I am bringing you, you are not going to lean on your own strength. You are not going to lean on your own ability. But I have not created any man that can resist that which is available to you if you will use it. Hallelujah. And then God told, you know, Israel, the word of God will not depart out of your mouth. You will confess my word. You will profess my word. You will prophesy my word. You know, this word of the Lord will not depart out of your mouth, but you will meditate on it day and night. You will remind yourself of the vision. You will remind yourself of the purpose. You will remind yourself of the goal so that you may have good success, so that you may prosper in that which I have given you. That was said in Joshua 1. And then 16 chapters after, you find the sons of Joseph, you know, Ephraim, Manasseh, struggling in the land. They found themselves on Mount Ephraim. Well, okay, let's go ahead and read the discussion they had with Joshua. They came to Joshua and like, look, you know, things aren't going the way they ought to go. Things are not exactly the way they should be. So verse 14, the message uh, interpretation. It says, the people of Joseph spoke to Joshua. Why did you, Joshua chapter uh, 17. It says, the people of Joseph spoke to Joshua. Why did you give us just one allotment? One solitary share? There are a lot of us, and we are growing. God has extravagantly blessed us. You know, the King James Version is like, why have you placed us in this street? Why have you placed us in this constraining environment? We are a great people. We are a large crowd. Why are we operating in this limiting environment? Hallelujah. So Mount Ephraim is like an environment that limits where the full promises of God are not actualized amongst the people of God. And Joshua responded. He says, since there are so many of you and you find the hill country of Ephraim too confining, Climb into the forest and clear ground there for yourselves in the land of the Perizzites and the Riffim. You know, somebody will say, a lot of times the people of God go to God and say, God, we are waiting for you. God, we are waiting for you. What is happening? And God turns around and says, I'm waiting for you. Everything you need, I have made available to you. I have told you what you can do. But I'm waiting for you to see what you are going to do. You know, but the people of Joseph said, but there's not enough hill country for us. And the Canaanites who live down in the plain, 
both those in Bethshan and his villages and in the valley of Jezreel, they have iron chariots. You are telling us we should take cutlasses and move in and clear the place. Are you aware of the fact that the Canaanites who are in the land, they have iron chariots. And we, you know, what do we have? We don't seem to have anything. Then Joshua said to them again, Yes, there are a lot of you, and you are very strong. One lot is not enough for you. Where you are now is a place of limitation. Hallelujah. Amen. You also get the ill country. It's nothing but trees now. But you will clear the land. You will make it your own from one end to the other. The powerful Canaanites, even with their iron, iron chariots, they won't stand a chance against you. Hallelujah. Amen. So, oh, there are chariots. Of course, God knows that there are chariots. They are mighty. You will not be the first person to mention that the, the people that, you know, God, God said there are people in the land, but you will displace them. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The history before then was that when well, they came there, they were weak. And the period when they were weak, they lived with the people, they lived with the things they ought to have overcome. Hallelujah. Now we'll go back uh, to that place in Jeremiah 31. You know, verse 1, again, it says, At the same time, says the Lord, Will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Hallelujah. Thus said the Lord, The people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. So there is a rest that God is causing his people to come into. A rest where the land is not constraining. The land is not limiting. A realm of largeness. A realm of increase. Then verse 3 says, The Lord had appeared of old unto me, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, do I draw you. Again, I will build you. And you shall be built. So the people of the Lord will be built at this time in the name of Jesus. Amen. The grace to build us up will be made available unto us Amen. in the name of Jesus. He says, you shall be built, O virgin of Israel. You shall again be adorned with thy tablets. You shall go forth in the dances of them that make merry. So, there will be rejoicing. There will be gladness in the midst of the people of the Lord. There will be, you know, a banishing of the spirit of melancholy and of woe in the midst of the people of the Lord. God says there will be rejoicing. There will be dancing. There will be the beating of the tambourine. And, you know, that will be the experience of his people. He says, you shall yet plant vines upon the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and shall eat them as common things. And a day shall come that the watchmen upon the Mount Ephraim. Now, when you look at the war, the watchmen, the question comes to mind, who are watchmen? Yeah. And as I began to look at this particular uh, story you find a few references in the Bible you know when you look at the book of Matthew when Jesus told the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins you discover that if you really look at that passage there were actually three groups of people in that place most times, attention is paid to just two groups. 
but it's actually free. He says, then shall the kingdom of heaven be like, that's Matthew 25. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lambs and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. So, first group, five wise virgins. Second group, five foolish virgins. They that were foolish took their lambs and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lambs. So, second category. Now, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. So, the ten, both wise and the foolish, all slept. Hallelujah. Amen. But interesting because it will appear as if there was a third group that did not sleep. He says, and at midnight there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Now I'm of the impression, and this has been mentioned before, that this third category were watchmen. They were there. They were watching. The wise, I mean, the, 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 the virgins who were wise did well well for themselves. But then there was a shortcoming. And the shortcoming was they slumbered and they slept. I'm sure possibly because of the time it took, you know, for the Lord to come. The Lord is delaying his coming. The Lord is delaying his coming. When exactly is he going to come? When will we see this coming of the Lord? And somewhere along the line, they slept. But there was a group that did not sleep, that were watching. They are not mentioned among the ten. But it says, at midnight, there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom coming. And my prayer will be, yeah, it's great to be among the wise virgin. But I'm not sure it is something that can be credited to us as a positive thing if we were to be found, you know, falling asleep. Hallelujah. This third group that did not sleep, that were watchful, that were waiting, were able to shout, wake up from your slumber. Wake up from sleep. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. If there is one thing the Lord has been laying on my mind very strongly, is the parable that he told. The parable when a lord, a, a householder, who was to go to receive a kingdom, called his servants and said, Occupy till I come. Occupy means be watchful, be waiting, be focused, be undistracted. Don't sleep, don't slumber. Occupy till I come. Hallelujah. Amen. And the account says he gave each one of them a talent and they left. Now, there's a place for the productivity of, you know, the Bible says, the, you know, first one who had one produced ten. There is a measure of that in what we are speaking now. But the area that has been of great interest to me lately has been the Lord said there are some when he was telling that parable he was speaking about the commitment and the faithfulness of those who were given talents. But much more was a concern that there were a group who said we will not have this man to rule over us. That there is a spirit that is working in the land. You know, that spirit is characterized by what you find in Psalm 2. Why do the even rage? The kings of the earth, they imagine a vain thing against the Lord and is anointed, saying, this man will not rule over us. You know, so to say, there is a spirit that is at work in men. Everywhere you go, you guys are saying Christ is coming, we will frustrate that purpose. All the groups you find around, ISIS, this, that, all manners, that is the result. Jesus will not come. And the account says, 
After he had finished with, okay, you have been faithful, you have been faithful, I am very happy about what you have done. He said, go and bring those my enemies who have said, we will not have you be, you know, Lord over us. And it's like, they will be slaughtered, they will be killed. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, when you look at that, the temptation is to imagine that those who say we will not have this man to rule over us are those who are out. But most times it starts from the church. Every time we have anything that can be contested, that this, you know, somebody was explaining that when you say Antichrist, Antichrist is not necessarily against Christ. That Antichrist most of the time is in the place of Christ. Not necessarily opposed to, but we can even say, oh, this thing is of Christ. But where Christ, where the thing is in the place of Christ, where it displaces Christ, then that becomes a problem. And that spirit, God is judging. So when God says, the watchmen on Mount Ephraim, going to Mount Zion, the way I look at it is, Mount Ephraim speaks of when you look at a few things in the scriptures. One, it says, a constraining place. When you look at Pentecost, Pentecost was a constraining place yeah. for the church. You know, when Peter, on the day of Pentecost, got up and was speaking, he was quoting Joel, and he said, this is what was written, I will pour out of my spirit. That is not what is in Joel, uh, uh, Joel chapter 2. I will pour out of my spirit is Pentecost. I will pour out my spirit is Tabernacles. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I will pour out means I have this container. It is full. And you bring a cup. Oh, you need small. I give you small. That is pouring out of. But I will pour out means you turn the bottoms up. Hallelujah. Amen. So. In Jeremiah 31, I believe what the Lord is saying is that there is a realm the church has operated in. And it's been like half of Christ, half of man. Hallelujah. Amen. But there is to be a cry at this time. A cry by the watchmen. Those who God has given seeing eyes and hearing ears to say we must not settle in the limiting place we must not settle in the constraining place we must not settle for less than is offered hallelujah Amen. you know god is offering the fullness of christ i was reading uh some time ago you know uh a book that brother hope wrote on on the journey to life and he was saying the problem you have in many of the churches you know, when you talk of the churches, all that come under the covering of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, is that many pick a part of the thrust of what God is doing. That there are four principal things that God is doing at this time. The first, you know, you find it in Romans 8. The first is that God is calling his people, is calling. There's a call that is going forth by the Spirit of the Lord. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Hallelujah. After the call, there is a saving. You know, a saving of the people of God. You know, people have a saving, a salvation experience, a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then going beyond that, you have a growing of the church. A growing of the church. And then a final phase, which is a perfecting of the church. Hallelujah. Those four. Now, the challenge we have is, you go to many churches, you find out that there's a calling going for. They call, be saved, be saved, be saved. Everywhere, you know, there's a combing of every corner. You must give your life to Christ and a saving. But the growing is where the problem is. Many of them... It's like, oh, you want to become a millionaire, you want to become a billionaire, you want to, you know. And that's not what Christ has, of course, 
you know, all that labor and our heavy lading. So in Christ, there is deliverance. There is, you know, it, it, it sets you free. It provides for you. You know, we're not preaching poverty or, or lack. That's not what Christ came to do. But then you have a gospel that is man-centered. Man is the center of, you know, the gospel. You know, everything about God is about you. You need anything, come to God and so on. And everything ends there. Yeah. But there is, apart from going a perfecting message to be like Christ. Hallelujah. Romans 8 says, God looked and he called. That those he calls, he justifies. Those he justifies, he glorifies. Hallelujah. He calls them that they may be conformed to the image of his son. That that is the goal, you know, of the salvation experience. But you discover that the church is not operating in the fullness of this. Part of the challenge has been for those out, many of the churches, it's be, you know, be called, be saved, and grow small. Now, the challenge we equally have, and that's part of, you know, the burden in the heart of the Lord, is yes, we are growing and we are perfecting, but we are not doing much of the calling and the saving of the church. There is not much of the calling, there is not much of the saving of the church. I don't know if you're getting, I'm, I'm, I'm getting across. And I believe there is a burden in the heart of the Lord as well. Why some are calling and saving and not doing much in the area of growing and perfecting, some are not calling, some are not saving. The few that they come in contact with, you know, are the ones that, okay, uh, you know, continue to grow. And there must be the full gospel. gospel. The, the, the whole thing must roll out and must be known everywhere. Amen. Hallelujah. So, we must break out of that limiting environment we have found ourselves operating in hallelujah Amen. maybe part of what is to drive what we are doing but god you are offering a people taking possession of mount zion the realm of perfection the realm of glory hallelujah Amen. i want us to open to psalm psalm 132 that for those who would operate in this realm, what kind of orientation, what kind of mindset should you know, be associated with them? Psalm 132, it says, Lord, remember David and all his afflictions. These people who determine to go to Mount Zion, what will characterize them? How will their minds work? What will God look at in their lives and say, oh yes, these guys desire what I desire. He says, Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swear unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. What did he swear? What did he vow unto God? He says, David vowed this. He said, Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyes. So they are like watchmen. If you remember, we mentioned earlier on, while the wise and the foolish virgins slept, there was a, another company that were watchful. They did not slumber. They did not sleep. And the cry was, hey, the bridegroom is coming. It's not just a proclamation, it's a lifestyle. The Lord is coming. Go ye out to meet him. The Lord is coming. Remember that I mentioned earlier on that. There are forces, there are groups who have said, we will not have this man rule over us. We are going to oppose this man. And this company of people make up their minds that, 
that resolve will not come to pass. It will not be. This man will rule over us. This man will reign. He will be king Amen. on the earth Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. Every opposition to his lordship, to his kingship, will be overruled, Amen. will be cast down in the name of Jesus. Amen. But we're talking about, you know, the watchman. He says, David, speaking like a watchman, said, I will not come into the tabernacle of my house. I have a house, but my focus is not my house. I have a bed, but my bed is not my focus. Hallelujah. It says, I will not give sleep to my eyes, nor slumber to my eyelids, until I find out a place for the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, a, a place as in, are we talking about a physical structure, a church? No. There is a determination in the heart of God. I desire a dwelling place. I desire a people in whom I will be totally placed. I will be totally entrenched. I will be totally Lord and King. Hallelujah. Amen. Earlier on, in the course of the prayer, you know, one of the statements that was made, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. As the waters cover the sea. What does it mean? It means as we meet people, we place Christ in them. As Christ is placed in them, they go forth shining as light. Amen. And a day God looks all over the earth and there are men and women in whom Christ is placed. Amen. And the life of Christ is seen in them all over the world. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That is the meaning of the knowledge of the glory of men we know. Before, it's like, well, you know, because if you remember, the burden of Abacock was, why do I see oppression? Why do I see calamity? Everywhere I, I see, I see unrighteousness. The righteous are overwhelmed by the wicked. By the time you find two, two, two righteous, there are eight wicked around them. And it's like, God, how long is this going to be? And he was crying to God and God said, calm down, my son. Write the vision. Make it plain that he may run that reader did. The first is the just shall live by faith. The just shall not live by what he sees. The just shall not live by his experience. The just shall live by the word of God, the spoken word of God. And this word, Lord, that you have said shall come to pass. And then secondly, God then reminded him that the, <clears throat> the earth shall be filled. With the knowledge of the glory of God. Oh yes, you see oppression, you see confusion, you see anarchy and so on. That is not the end story. That is only a part of the story. But the final story is, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the earth. Hallelujah. Amen. But then how shall this be? It shall be as the watchmen. Finding themselves in a place of constraint. Say, we will not dwell here. We are not going to build our own tabernacle here. We are not going to rest here. We are going to stretch forth. We are going to move forward. And what we characterize those people, and we are saying that they will be like David. David was a mighty man. He could easily have said to God, you have said to me. You could have done like Saul. God made Saul king. And so, well, okay, where is God? I don't have time for God. I'm busy. I have other things I'm doing. Everything about God didn't weigh much with him. Hallelujah. Amen. When I look at him, it's like Esau. You know, he did not value what God had given him. But David was not like that. David said, oh God, you built, you, 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 you picked me. Seven before him. Seven brothers. Passed all the seven and picked him and made him king. Then he built himself a house. I said, no. I will build God a house. And God came. Okay, you want to build me a house? I'm, I'm, you, you, are, you are blowing my mind. May we blow the mind of the Lord in the commitments we make in the name of Jesus. God said, okay, you want to build me a house? No. I will build you a house. Your house will be an enduring one. Hallelujah. Amen. He said, I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids. Until I find out a place for the Lord. 
an habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Lo, we heard of it in Ephrata. We found it in the fields of the wool. We will go into his tabernacles. We will worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into your rest. Where is the rest of the Lord? The lives of his people. So it's like there must be a burden until Christ is formed in the lives of men. We can't afford to rest. It's like it will be criminal for us to say, Lord, I can relax and have a, a grand time. When that, which is the biggest burden in the heart of God, is not being fulfilled. God desires to live in men, to rest in men, to reveal his glory in men. And he will do it only through us. Amen. As long as we decide not to do anything, he is limited. His hands, you know, the Bible says, I mean, uh, is, is, is the Lord's hand short that he cannot save? But which hand is he going to use? Is our hands that we use. We are like the hands of God. We are like the mouth of God. We are like the feet of God. It's where we carry him, he goes. He limits himself to that extent. Hallelujah. He says, arise, O Lord, into your rest. You and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness. Let your saints shout for joy. For thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thy anointed. And the Lord responds, the Lord has sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of your body will I set upon my throne. It's like if you, a basic principle the Lord Jesus Christ laid, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other things that can be important to you shall be added unto you. You know, if your children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon your throne forevermore. For the Lord had chosen Zion, a perfected people, a people of his own, a people who reflect him, who are like him on the earth. He has desired it for his habitation. He has desired his people, a people who are totally sold out to him as his resting place. He says, this is my rest forever. He's not talking of a physical location. He's talking of a people. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. Now for me, for God to use I have desired, there's, there's a desire in my heart. There is something that blows my mind. There's something that is core in my heart. And you hear it. That should propel. God, if that's what is in your heart, then chill. You know, relax. I, 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 I will move. Now, I was mentioned, I think it was on Sunday, that when we catch the vision of what is uppermost in the mind of God, Provisions are a secondary thought. He will provide. He says, I will abundantly bless our provision. Whose provision? The provisions of Zion. The provisions of a cause that is in my heart. When you tap into that which is the burden of my heart, the thrust of my heart, then adequate provision is available. I will abundantly if he says I will bless a provision, that is enough coming from God. But to say, I will abundantly bless Hallelujah. a provision. Hmm. I will satisfy a poor with bread. Hmm. Hallelujah. Amen. I will clothe our priests with salvation. Our saints shall shout aloud for joy. There will I make the horn of David to bow. The evidence that I am right there with David will not be lacking. It will be manifest. Amen. He says, I have ordained a lamb for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. Amen. Now, does this apply only to physical David that died many years ago? No, as many Davids as will line up with the body in the heart of God. You know, last Sunday we were speaking about um, another promise unto Zion, Psalm 48. 
you know, just a very quick reference to it again. You know, when a people are totally sold out to God, doing what he wants them to do, Psalm 48, says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful when elevated, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. The idea is that when a people are totally given to God, God promised, as you find in Isaiah 2, I will establish them in the top of the mountains. I will lift them up. I will exalt them. And when they are exalted, they are the joy of the whole earth. The Bible says creation is groaning, waiting for the unveiling of the sons of God. And the challenge is, will the sons of God be hiding their heads and so on? Yeah, we, like we said, it suffice for Moses. Initially, the early part of his life, you know, Moses was, ah, yes, I know I am the Savior. I am here to save and went in the energy of the flesh and ran into problems. But for a while, God br brought him aside, took him into the desert, and took him through another training. But a time came when Moses was to be brought back. And I believe the Lord is saying, we need to arise at this time. We need to stand up at this time. We need to go forth in the name of the Lord. We'll just quickly go back again to that Jeremiah, you know, 31. The Bible says, we are the joy of the whole earth. It's Mount Zion. Mount Zion is not a physical mountain. It refers to a people. The city of the living God. He desires to dwell in us. To reveal himself in us. Hallelujah. It says, For there shall be a day, verse 6, that the watchmen upon the Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, let us go up to Zion, unto the Lord our God. For thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob. And shout among the chief of the nations. Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Then God responds, this is what I desire to do. I will bring them. Of course, there was a physical, you know, fulfillment of this for physical Israel. But there's a spiritual restoration, a returning, an ascending, and a desire for God. At this time, he says, I will bring them from the north country. I will gather them from the coast of the earth. And with them, the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and I tra travelleth with child together. A great company shall return either. They shall come with weeping, and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers. So it's not going to be a dry experience. The Lord will cause us to walk by rivers in a straight way, not in a crooked way. There had been so much crookedness in the church, but the Lord will cause a walking in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the eyes afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him. He will keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. The Lord will keep his people. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, one other thing the Lord ministered, we will find in Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54. 
that that which he will do was similar to the experience of Anna and Penina. Isaiah 54, reading from verse 1, it says, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent. Let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy course, strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Hallelujah. So a person might look and say, our experience has been like that of Anna. That you can look around and see many. And I'm talking about the spiritual work that is being done. You know, for a long time, Anna did not have any child. And it's like, where do you really need any child? You should be satisfied as you are. Stay. If you need any child. Call any of uh, Penina's children, send them on uh, errand, and everything will be okay. Until when Anna decided, I am not going to live with this limitation. I am not going to live with this constraint. I am going to do something about it. Hallelujah. Amen. And a very good illustration of this you find in Joel 2. And, you know, Joel 1, Joel 2, Joel 3. And the call is, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. You know, because you look at Israel, a tree is shown, stripped of fruit, stripped of leaves, stripped of the bark, even the roots. And then there was a call. Let a people seek God. Let them lay hold upon God and cry, spare your people, O Lord. Why should the heathen say, where is your God? You know, it's like, you find yourself in some situations where people say, people say you, you are serving God. How come? How is it that it is with you like this? Why is it like this with you? Hallelujah. And then, you know, God moves in as they cry, as they lay hold upon him. You know, he moves in with them. And he begins to change the situation. If you read Jeremiah 31, you see God making reference to the fact that he will give them wine, oil, and corn. You find it in Joel 2. You find it in Jeremiah 31. I will give you wine. I will give you oil. I will give you corn. You know, wine means I will bring joy into your midst. There will be gladness. I will bring you corn. It means... There will be material blessings. I will bring you oil. There will be anointing upon your heads. There will be the evidence that God is with you. Hallelujah. But the instruction is enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch for the curtains of your habitations. Spare not. Lengthen. Now, the first place is in our minds. In our minds. If we tell ourselves, well, we can stay. You know, one of the things I've been asking myself is, even here in this Houston, there are assemblies where people gather and there are thousands who gather there. Now, what brings them there? Whatever we may say about what's going on there, they gather every, every Sunday to the name of the Lord. But the issue is the amount of light they have. Well, maybe let me just share this. You know, about three to four weeks ago, uh, myself, Brother Alade, Brother Amos, and Brother Ebuta, we traveled to Cameroon. You know, we've been going every year. And we went for a conference. And at the conference, many of those we had been ministering to came. And we had two full days of, you know, a wonderful time. And then when we finished, Brother Alade called and said, I mean, this is good. 
But would this not have been more glorious if we had that the amount of life that went forth in ministry, the, 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 the words that went out, that would this have been a very fruitful, I mean, the, the, the idea is, it's like somebody who makes an investment. Is, is, is this a very good investment? Wouldn't more people have been blessed if they had had the opportunity of hearing what was going for? Then I say, ah, next time, let's work on it. If you know anybody anywhere, if there is any way, you know, we can reach out. Are, are, are we hiding what we have? Are we ashamed of what we have? What we have is, is so glorious, is so empowering. One of the things that I've been asking myself is, how come that people at this time take ISIS or any of these uh, Al-Qaeda and co? You know, we say they are criminal people, they are horrible people. Every time you hear that the parents of the young boys and girls who they've managed to get even to today i might not be able to find my way on my laptop to the sites where these guys you know go but isis with how horrible they have have found a way of developing a site putting information there and youths all over the world are accessing it and it is so convincing that they pack their things in England, they pack their things in France, they pack their things in America, wherever it is, and add and all the information they need to find their way into uh, Syria, into Iran, or wherever it is, uh, Iraq, wherever they are, they find their, their way there. Now, I keep asking myself, what?